Good evening, everybody. This is Dr. Rick Lehman. Tonight, we're going to be talking about forearm fractures, both bone fractures, forearm fractures. And we have a, a great group tonight uh, with Dr. Colleen Glisson and Caitlin, who uh, I know very well. And uh, I'm going to have them introduce themselves. Forearm fractures are fairly common in football. I'm a sports guy. We see forearm fractures. Usually, I'll refer them out. I'm not a hand guy. But uh, it's not an uncommon fracture. Dr. Glisson, go ahead and introduce yourself. I'm Dr. Colleen Glisson. I'm an orthopedic surgeon specializing in hand and upper extremity. I work for Advanced Bone and Joint in St. Charles. Awesome. Thank you very much. Ms. Caitlin, go ahead and introduce yourself. My name is Caitlin Whiteley. I'm a physical therapist. I work for Core Physical Therapy at the South County location in St. Louis, Missouri. And so we're going to talk about forearm fractures tonight. And again, pretty common injury. Uh, Dr. Glisson, why don't you go ahead and start with explaining the anatomy of the forearm, forearm excuse me, the interosseous membrane, um, stability of the radial head, et cetera, and kind of explain what, what a forearm fracture is. What are we talking about? So your forearm is formed by your radius and your ulna. So at the wrist, the radius is big and the ulna is little. At the elbow, the ulna is big and it goes into your olecranon. We call it the olecranon up there. Um, and the radius is little. So there's joints at either end. At the distal end by the wrist, we call it the distal radial ulnar joint. And then at the elbow, the radius is actually kind of round and we call it the proximal radial ulnar joint. And that's really where you get your rotation. The two bones are connected throughout your forearm by something called your interosseous membrane. Um, so it kind of tethers them together. It gives some stability to the forearm uh, as does the radial head at the elbow. That's awesome. And in terms of people who come in with forearm fractures, both bone fractures, how do they, what happens? How do they, what's the mechanism of injury? How do they break their forearm? Usually it's a fall um, or fall on something. I saw somebody today who got hit with a hockey stick, um, but in general, it's a fall. That's great. And that's right. I mean, a fall on an outstretched arm. Um, we actually see a fair number of, uh, we call them nightstick fractures. Yes. Uh, but forearm fractures, generally when they're both bone and they're a little displaced are pretty miserable. Um, why don't you give us a little interlude into what else can happen, associate injuries. We talked a little bit about Galeazzi fractures a second ago. Tell us about compartment syndrome. Uh, tell us about Galeazzi and Montasia fractures. Kind of give us some of the other issues that can occur when you break your forearm. So theoretically, you can get a compartment syndrome. Um, usually, it's associated with higher energy trauma. Um, but what it means is that the pressure in your forearm goes up usually because something's bleeding. And if it's untreated, uh, you can have a lot of problems with nerves and muscle necrosis, that type of thing. It's, very, it's pretty uncommon, is what I would say. Um, other things are the associated things with the fractures. Because those two bones are connected, it's hard to injure one without the other, um, depending on where in the bone it is. So it's most common to break both. Sometimes like if you break your radius at a certain spot, you can dislocate that distal radial ulnar joint. Likewise, you can break your ulna more towards the proximal end and dislocate that proximal radial ulnar joint. Um, so those are some of the common things. Um, most often, there's both of them break. Um, it can be at the same level or they can be different, it just depends on how the mechanism happened. And, and kind of walk us through your physical exam in terms of neurovascular status, uh, what nerves are at risk, um, explain open fractures and closed fractures a little bit. So what are you looking for when that patient comes in? They have a forearm fracture, a both bone fracture uh, in terms of physical exam. So these patients hurt. I mean, 
unless it's just the isolated ulna, which we call the nightstick fracture, like a both bone forearm fracture hurts. Those bone ends are sitting there in the muscle. Um, so pain, you look for deformity. Um, you wanna check to see their nerves. Theoretically, any of the nerves um, is at risk. It, it could be median, ulnar, or radial, uh, kind of depending on where the fracture is. So you wanna check their hand, um, check their perfusion. And then, you know, we say with the compartment syndrome, pain out of proportion, which sometimes is hard to tell on these, except we know that the compartment syndrome is rare. Usually once you get them splinted, they feel better because then it's not moving. And I agree. I, I think compartment pressure, compartment syndrome is very rare. Um, if you miss it, it's a disaster, but you don't see it very frequently. And usually, I think you're right. I mean, the forearms tense, they have terrible pain moving their fingers. So I think if they don't get better after you splint them, it kind of makes you a little bit nervous. Yes, and, I agree. And in terms of radiographs, x-rays, are there any, like you said, on just the radius fractures, usually they present with x-rays. Is there any special views we need to get? Is it fairly straightforward? How do you know if the fracture is displaced? Kind of go through your thought process a little bit. I usually, usually they'll get um, AP and lateral views of the forearm, kind of depending on what I see there. These ones, and depending on the exam, where they're more tender, I'll often get wrist or elbow films. Um, I rarely get a CT scan or anything like that for these. And, and how, how do you generally treat, so someone comes in with a both, both bone form fracture, kind of walk through your, your algorithm in terms of how you, how you treat them, um, talking about fracture patterns and how you make your decisions. Well, if it's pediatric, those are almost the only ones that we treat without surgery. <laughs> so even some of those can be, depending on how young the child is, if they're displaced, they're okay because their uh, growth plates are open and you can put them in a cast and they'll be fine. Almost every adult with a both bone forearm fracture needs surgery. I think that's right. And, 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 and I think your, your characterization, characterization of two bones is very important because they may be fractured at the same level, but I think they're just inherently unstable. So I, I couldn't agree more. I think adults, and I think if you think you're going to treat them in a cast, you learn quickly that that was not the greatest idea. Yes. Um, so, Caitlin, in terms of PT, same question. When do you start? When do you want to see this, this fracture pattern? Uh, walk us through their, their PT and what they can expect when they get to PT after having an uh, open reduction internal fixation of a fracture. So I think I like to see them as soon as they can tolerate it. Um, like you both alluded to, they're super painful, um, especially at the beginning. So sometimes a little too early, they start hating me a little bit too much. So I don't like to see them that early. Um, but as soon as that bone is starting to heal and they can tolerate it. Um, and with that, it kind of depends on, was it at the same level? Was it not at the same level? So I kind of refer back to the MD at that point. And when they're ready for me to start seeing them, I want to get them in the door and start getting them to feel better. And, and what do you do for them? I mean, they broke both bones in their forearm. You work on their elbow, do you work on the wrist? What, what, what do you have to do? All of the above. I think that's what's hard about these forearm fractures is their elbows involved, their wrist is involved. Um, so it's really about restoring that normal range of motion in both. Um, and I think the one thing that they're not expecting to struggle with that I see all the time is that pronation and supination. You know, they think about their elbow bending and straightening because that's what they need to do to do a lot of daily tasks. And they think about their wrists moving. Um, but what they don't think about is how much during their day they go palm up and palm down. So I really try to attack that pronation and supination as early as possible, um, because if you don't, they get stuck and then it's a world of hurt and I have to push them and they don't like that. And so the sooner I can get them pronating and supinating, the better. And you, and Kaylin, you think they get most of the rotation back or do they have some limitations? And the same question about extension and flexion, you think they get most of motion back? I think it depends on their age and where exactly those fractures were. 
Um, I try to tell them all the time that no forearm fracture is the same. So, you know, the more proximal it is and the more near that radial head, the more I get nervous about the pronation and supination. Um, but I think for your young athletes, they're generally going to gain back most of their range of motion and for sure be functional, being able to return to not only their daily lives, but their sport based activities as well. Thank you, Dr. Glisson, you, you fix one of these fractures and before you send it, Caitlin, how long do you immobilize them for? Do they, do they need a cast after forearm plates or what do you do post-op? I usually put them in a splint for two weeks. Um, just because again, they're sore. Like, I feel like they need a little bit of time to rest. Um, but part of me feels like Caitlin was saying the point of, I mean, part of the point besides stabilizing it of putting those plates on is getting them moving so that their elbow doesn't get stiff and they get their rotation back. So at two weeks, I'll often switch them. If I've got, depending on how proximal it is, I'll often switch them to a wrist splint that they can take on and off that they can get the elbow moving and start doing some range of motion. And in terms of fixing them, is there any indication for bone graft or when, when do you worry about the fracture either being a slow to heal, a malunion or a non-union or delayed union? Is there any time that you would alter your treatment pattern in terms of um, the fracture pattern? Usually in, we touched on this earlier, but didn't go anywhere with it, but I've rarely needed to bone graft primarily unless it was something that was open. And I, I haven't seen too many open forearm fractures from sports. Like every once in a while, there'll be one that just has a little spike that pokes through the skin, but like a big, bad open fracture that you tend to see more from a motor vehicle accident, that type of thing. I have had to bone graft those initially. I usually, unless it's a revision though, you don't need that level of stuff. And, and so somebody comes in that a both bone fracture, they got one little tiny pinhole or maybe a spike of the distal radius or the radius poked through, what, what, what do you have to do? I mean, do you wash them out? Do you, treat, do you not worry about it? What, what do you do? Usually if it's one little spike, you know, if I saw them in the ER, I'd wash them out and then I'd probably fix it later on an elective basis. There's all sorts of data that shows that those type one open fractures in the forearm are at a very low risk of infection. And so, so, so that would make you too nervous. Now you're kind of talking about the big bad open fracture, farm accident, motor vehicle accidents. Um, you close them right away and you probably haven't seen a million of them in private practice, but do you close them right away? Do you leave them open? How do you, how do you, how do you deal with the skin? Depends on what it looks like. I mean, there, I've done both in the past. Um, it it kind of just depends on what that soft tissue envelope looks like is what I would say. Like I try to at least partially close it because I think they do better with that. You know, sometimes especially the farm accident stuff, like sometimes the skin just isn't there and you end up putting a wound back on and grafting it later. Excellent. And, and, and then one last question for, for both you guys, both bone forearm fracture, 19 year old, freshman in college, hockey player, when can he go back to playing hockey? Caitlin? I have to say they're a little, like sometimes they can be a little slow to heal. <laughs> so I want to see bridging bone before I let them go back to hockey, to, to a contact sport. I'll let them move it. I'll let them do some skating and some other activities, but I don't want my plate to fail because it's not completely healed. So. And Kaylin, what do they have to do PT wise to go back? What, what, so what I think, the, of them? I think a big thing I see here is they, um, and I don't know if it's cause that bone just isn't fully healing or just all the moving parts, but they remain painful for a long time. Um, and so the biggest thing that I want to see is that they're able to do all the activities that they need to do for sport pain-free. Um, so especially with something like hockey, I need to make sure their grip strength is good enough that they can hold that hockey stick the way that they need to. Their range of motion is good enough um, in all planes, in both the elbow, the forearm, the wrist, that they can, you know, deliver a quick slap shot or something like that. So 
Um, I think just making sure they're pain free because with these, I've seen them linger longer than maybe I would expect from a 19 year old guy who would usually heal up pretty quick. That was excellent, everybody. Additional comments, anything we need to uh, talk about? Anything we no. forgot? The only other thing I might add is those ulnar plates almost always end up coming out. People have that? them. It, it, uh, explain why you, why you would want to take uh, the ulnar plate out. You know, the ulna is a relatively superficial bone. So even though you try to tuck it under so that it's going to be, you know, not exposed, it's hard to, especially because the forearm rotates. So especially young people, I think they find that plate irritating. Um, and sometimes you can even see it on their arm, depending on how thin they are. If, especially if they're an athlete, I make them wait a year before I'll take the plate out. And do you protect them after that? Do you put them, you put them in a splint to play or do you protect them after that? I protect them for about six weeks in some kind of splint. Usually we try to take it out in an off season if we can. So there was a famous football player, Mr. Gronkowski had a forearm fracture. They took the plate out and he refractured. So in that situation, if you know you're gonna go back to contact sports, can they go back to contact sports with the plate out or are you at risk? Kind of give me your thoughts. I think you're at risk at first. Like I said, I think it takes about six weeks for those screw holes to fill in. After that, I think you're probably at the risk equal to what it was initially. That's awesome. That's a very good point as well. Everybody, thank you very much. Um, you guys are awesome.